Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hope Church. We are so excited to worship with you from wherever you are this morning, whether it is at home, whether it is online or here. We just thank you for joining us. Would you please stand um, with us for worship? Dear Lord, we are thank you, thanking you for this day, thanking you for bringing us here for this whole year as well. Father, you see each and every person in this room under the sound of my voice, Lord, and you know what this year has brought them. And we know that you know what this upcoming year holds as well. So we just look to you this morning. Lord, in Psalm 46, 10, you say, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So we just look to you this morning, Father. Help us to focus our hearts on you, to have a heart of worship and praise, no matter what we're going through, because you are constant. You are here. You are present. And you are worthy of this praise. We love you and we need you. In Jesus' name we pray. Can you sing this with us, church? God, I look to you. God, I look to you. I won't be overwhelmed. Give me a vision to see things like you do. God, I look to you. You're where my help comes from. Give me wisdom. You know just what to do. You know just what to do. We look to you, and we won't be overwhelmed. over our job and workplace, co-workers, over our mindset. He is reigning over it all. So with one voice, church, let's sing hallelujah, our God reigns. Oh, yeah. 
see how you are working, but we can look back and see you present there with us. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days have been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up, Till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life, He is faithful. All my life, You have been faithful. All my life, You have been so, so. sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire and darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father.
this morning. Help us to focus on what you need us to hear, Lord. We are listening. We come hungry, thirsty, some of us weary and burdened, Lord, but we are here for you. We long for more of you. So be with us this morning. We praise you, we love you, and we need you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated, and while you're sitting, may you read, say hi to your neighbor. It is so good to conclude the year and then begin the new year, um, worshiping our God and being with brothers and sisters in Christ. So welcome to our Greece campus, to our Brockport campus, those who are watching online. Just a few things before uh, Pastor Jeffrey shares uh, God's word with us. Love to connect with you, especially if you're new. There's a connect card in front of you. Love for you to fill that out. Take it to the welcome desk. We have a gift for you and love to share that with you. Also, that card is used for prayer requests encourage you to fill that out, put it in the offering box on the way out. We have a team of people who would love to pray for those uh, requests. Just want to let you know that next week, immediately following this service, I'm going to be up front. If you have any questions about the ministry of Hope Church and what we're doing, love to meet with you. Um, it's just an opportunity to meet with me and let me share a little bit about the vision and the values here at Hope Church. So that's going to be taking place uh, after the service next week, right up front over here. And then just want to let you know about the new year. And uh, we are praying that God is going to do an amazing work in us. And when we open up his word, he works. He forms Christ in us. And so next year, we are going to begin the New Testament challenge. And that is for everybody at Greece, Brockport, Campus Online, everybody that calls Hope Home. We are hoping that you will join this challenge with us, which is to read through the New Testament in the year. And there's going to be reading plans that are going to be given out, and uh, we're going to talk more about it as we kick it off next week. Um, great opportunity also to be in a more in-depth Bible study of the Word, and uh, they are going to be online as well as the app, but also there's hard copies that are out at the welcome desk. 25 different opportunities to be in the study of God's Word, four or six weeks, really to dig in a particular topic of Scripture. And when you let God's Word wash over you like that, it forms you. So we're encouraging, challenging everybody. If you've never been in a Bible class here, okay, that in 2024, you will attend at least one of these. And then you will be blessed for doing so, and the Lord will strengthen and build your faith. So just wanted to make you aware of that. This is a great opportunity, too, to invite your unchurched friends and neighbors to come and join us in that New Testament challenge because we're really going to get to know Jesus uh, through this uh, series that's really going to take us from Matthew to Revelation in 2024. So wanted to make you aware of that. And again, you can pick these up or uh, starting the new year, it'll be on the website and, and the app. And you'll hear more about it as we kick it off next week. So let's invite Pastor Jeffrey to come up and he can share God's word with us. My name is Jeffrey. I'm one of the pastors here at Hope. If I've not gotten a chance to meet you yet, or if you're new here, uh, and a special thank you to those of you tuning in online or out of Brockport campus, uh, welcome. I'm sh so excited and thrilled to share God's word with you today. Uh, now, in preparation for sharing that word, what uh, I invite all of you to do is, uh, if you brought a Bible with you, uh, or you can find one in the pew in front of you or in the seat next to you, go ahead and grab that, open it up to James chapter 1. It's towards the end of the Bible. 
Uh, you could also pull out a, a mobile device or however you would like to pull uh, Scripture up. And if you're saying, well, gosh, I don't have a Bible next to me and I forgot my phone, fear not. We will have the words up on the screen, so feel free to tune in that way as well. So James chapter 1, starting in verse 2, it says this. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls and its beauty perishes, so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Just pray with me. Well, gracious God, we thank you for this day. Thank you for a chance to come together, uh, to be in community with one another, to hear your promises and receive your good gifts. Lord, I ask that you would fill uh, this place with your Holy Spirit this morning and fill our hearts that we may be opened up to receive your word. Open our ears to hear that which you would have us hear and open our eyes to see you active and moving, not just in this place, but in our lives. And Lord, I pray that you would uh, open me up uh, to use me as, as your vessel, uh, that the words that I speak today may not be my words, but your very words. Not a word more and not a word less. I pray all these things in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Well, nothing is over quite like Christmas. That's a sentiment my great grandmother used to express every Christmas or every evening on Christmas Day. And it's one that I'm willing to imagine or, or bet that all of us understand all too well. Because after months and months of pretending like we're mad about hearing Christmas music in the radios and stores since October, all of it just goes away in an instant. And after watching those classic movies we just can't celebrate the holidays without, or scrolling through the catalog of the newest Hallmark Christmas movies with the same old plot, it just seems weird to watch them on December 26th, because nothing is over quite like Christmas. After coordinating schedules with all the different holiday parties and deep cleaning the house and preparing meals and rooms for all the guests, untangling Christmas slides, dusting off old decorations, and finally giving that, that gift you've been dying to give that special loved one since last Christmas when you forgot to give it to them, everything just comes to an abrupt end. Nothing is over quite like Christmas. The big day that we've waited so long for and, and been so excited about has come, and now it's gone, and we have to wait another 51 weeks before we experience the next one. All the presents are unwrapped. The trash bags are filled with the carnage of what was once pristinely wrapped packages. All the cookies are either gone or eaten. Family that's still in town is probably going to be packing up their bags soon to head home. And there's nothing to look forward to except the end of the cold, dark winter that's looming right outside of all of our doors. 
And I don't care how many times you tell me it's, it's mild here. <laughs> I know it gets worse. And pretty soon, all of us are going to be ready for it to end. Nothing is over quite like Christmas. And even though we're still technically in the Christmas season, it doesn't really feel like it anymore, does it? Like, even though Christmas isn't over, it's hard to find anyone who's really still celebrating. And the overall mood and the atmosphere right now just seems to be, well, as gray as it is. And yeah, we might find a a brief bit of reprieve or respite as we reign in the new year tonight. But let's be honest, as, as as, as, as nice as it is to celebrate the new year, it's small potatoes compared to Christmas. And as Pastor Kirk warned us last week on Christmas Eve would be the case today, all the gaiety and magic of the season is now a distant past memory, and it's hard to go back to the way things were. It's hard to find joy in the midst of all these transitions. I know I'm certainly having a tough time with it, I'll admit it. Because of all the three plus decades I've been celebrating Christmas, I don't think I've had anyone quite like this Christmas with so many firsts. This is the first Christmas I've celebrated as a pastor. It's the first Christmas I've I've had in my own home. It's the first Christmas I've been here in New York. This is the first Christmas I've celebrated with not one, but two kids. And this is the first Christmas that our oldest son, Michael, has really been aware of and experienced the magic that is Christmas. He started singing along to carols this year and dancing along to them too. He started to marvel at all the Christmas lights we'd see as we drive through the neighborhoods at night. And you could see his face light up with wonder each and every morning as he became more and more aware of the concept of things like festive decorations that are unique to this time of year, and all the excitement and anticipation of Santa and Christmas Eve, and even the wonder of the baby Jesus. And these things became part of the reality in which he lived, and honestly, it's really sad for me to see that start to go for him, even though I know it'll probably be back next year. And I know for some of us, the the Christmas season is difficult for us to to celebrate for a whole host of other reasons. And and so after a series where we've heard about the joy that is ours in Christ Jesus around this time of year, I thought it was only fitting to address the hardships we might be facing on the heels of the most wonderful time of the year and talk about joy when our year isn't going quite so wonderfully. And in order to do that, I wanted us to to dive a little bit into the New Testament letter known as the book of James, because this letter was written in a time of intense suffering for Christians. See, after Jesus had died and rose and ascended, his followers in in the ancient Jewish capital of Jerusalem started telling everyone all about who Jesus was and what he had done. And people are being converted left and right, and it led to the formation of the very first Christian church right there in the Jewish hub of Jerusalem. Well, naturally, the the Jewish ruling class at the time uh, didn't care much for this. They were a little bit resistant. And so the high priest began arresting these street preachers who were publicly proclaiming Jesus as the Christ, the Holy One of God, the one that they had all been waiting for. And there were even some who said, you know what? It's not good enough that they're arrested. We need to silence them for good. And so Christians began to be persecuted and even killed. But things started to turn around. See, if you read the first number of chapters in the book of Acts, you see that God preserved the message of Jesus by sending angels to lead jailbreak after jailbreak for the followers of Jesus who were behind bars. And then God took the church's biggest opponent, their biggest rival in Saul, And God converted him to Christianity. So now, instead of Saul being the biggest enemy in opposition of the church, he now becomes the biggest champion and promoter of Jesus Christ, known to us today as the beloved Apostle Paul. And so these early Christians who, up to this point, have only known resistance and persecution, they start to look at all the wonderful things God's doing all around them, and they start to think this 
This is awesome. We're untouchable. No prison bars can hold us in. No authorities can hold us down. And even our biggest threat is playing for our team now. He's wearing our jersey. He's one of us. Isn't this great? And like Christmas, there's a particular buzz in the air as wonder begins to replace worry. But just like Christmas, it's only for a season that's all too short. Because then we get to Acts chapter 12. And in Acts chapter 12, we see that, that Christians are fleeing persecution once again. We see the apostle James is killed by King Herod. And Peter is back in prison. And this church in Jerusalem that was, that was so confident a minute ago now is hiding out in someone's living room with the curtains closed, the lights dimmed, and the doors locked. Nothing is over quite like Christmas. But if you keep reading, you see that God rescues Peter from prison. And he sends him to this congregation, uh, to this meeting at this person's house. And it goes on to say in verse 17, that Peter instructs the people there to tell a different James, different than the apostle who was just killed. Uh, this James, presumably being the brother of Jesus, who was a, a pillar, so to speak, in the early church. Uh, so James instructs them to tell this James about how bad things have gotten for Christians in Jerusalem. And it's in this context, upon hearing about the trials and suffering and hardships of these Christians, that James pens this letter as a source of hope and encouragement for Christians abroad. And so it should stop us dead in our tracks when right out of the gate, James addresses the situation at hand with, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet various trials. Now notice that he doesn't say if you face trials or when you face a singular trial, right? This isn't, man, I had to wake up so early this morning to shovel snow off my driveway. Or Tim Hortons ran out of my favorite flavor, peppermint mocha. Or I have to go to a New Year's Eve party with my spouse's coworkers who I really don't gel with tonight. That's not what this is. This is, I had to get up ridiculously early to shovel so much snow off my driveway that by the time I was done, Tim Hortons had run out of peppermint mocha lattes. And then I went straight from there to get stuck in a sea of people at Wegmans trying to find something to bring to a New Year's Eve party that I really don't want to go to and was there for so long that I missed the Bills game. And then I got hit by a car. <laughs> and it's in that moment, in the midst of all the pain and the brokenness, that's when James is telling us to rejoice. Now, why on earth would he be telling us to do that? Because there's really only two types of people who would celebrate in a moment like that. Either someone who's completely out of touch with reality, like they think they're a tea kettle or something, or someone who knows something. And James falls into this latter category. Because James knows that there's a purpose in the pain. That beneath the surface of all the struggle, there's something else going on. James knows that God uses suffering as a way to strengthen his people. And while this may be a difficult or uncomfortable thing for us to, to think about or, or hear, it's really not a, a concept that we're altogether unfamiliar with. Right? Like, who, who all has heard the phrase, no pain, no gain? Right? All, all that means is that pain is helping me to achieve that which I am currently lacking. So I might be lacking a desired uh, physique or level of health, and so I might join a gym where I start to go to willingly subject my body to intense suffering, tearing down muscle fibers. And why? So that they can grow back stronger. And as they continue to strengthen, it's helping me to go from where I was to where I want to be. And even though I know that each workout is going to involve pain and discomfort and struggle, knowing what that suffering produces helps me to rejoice in its presence and persevere through it. So that then begs the question, what is it that James wants us to gain exactly? Or, or maybe to ask it a better way, what, um, what is it that God wants to give us as a result of our suffering. 
Well, I think for starters, he wants to give us wisdom. More specifically, he wants to give us the wisdom to know just how utterly dependent and reliant upon him we really are, to see that he alone is our source of strength. That he alone lifts us up and that everything we have and all that we are are the direct result of what he has given to us. And nothing exposes this truth quite like being in a vulnerable state where we can't kick or scream or claw or scrape our own way out. And we have to be fully reliant upon something wholly outside of ourselves. And the lower we are in these moments, the more we have no choice but to look up and see our Savior with nail-scarred hands reaching out to us to draw us in, to bring us close, to pick us up and to strengthen him, to rely on him. And we know that we can rely on him because he knows what it's like to remain joyful in the presence of pain. In fact, there's no pain that we can feel that he hasn't already experienced. He was betrayed by someone close to him. He was rejected by his people, felt the intense pangs of hunger and thirst. He knew what it was like to live in poverty and to be homeless. He suffered the most intense physical pain that the world has ever known, and the list goes on and on and on. And while his life was marked by this suffering, it all culminated together in the hours leading up to his death. And so it's in our struggles that the book of Hebrews tells us to look to him, our Savior Jesus Christ, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. It was his joy to suffer and die so that we might be reconciled to God. It was the whole reason he was born. And even though he was born to suffer and die, that's not the end of his story. Because his resurrection proves that he's stronger than the worst pain imaginable, the sting of death, the separation from God. And by God's grace, death now isn't the end of our story for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. And that's ultimately what we're celebrating on Christmas. Yes, we celebrate a baby, and yes, we celebrate gifts and family, but ultimately what we're celebrating is the fact that in the midst of a dark and dying and broken and suffering world, the light of the world joyfully and willingly entered in to be with us. We celebrate the gift that Emmanuel is here, that God is with us even in our suffering. And he entered in as one of us to identify with us in that pain and to suffer for us on our behalf. And now the eternal life that we have through him means that he doesn't just identify with us in our pain, but we get to identify with him in his joy. See, for those of us who are in Christ Jesus, we know that because he suffered, our suffering has an end date. And because he lives, the eternal life that we have in him is ours when he enters into our world once again. See, wise living doesn't mean figuring out how to dodge suffering to escape it, and to maneuver our lives around it. Wise living means finding joy by seeing what others can't see in the midst of it. It means that as we go through the darkness of this life, we don't just marvel at little blips of hope like Christmas lights shining in the, in the darkness, but instead we marvel at the splendor of the light of the world who was born to us in the pains of childbirth. And instead of seeing the things around us as, as neatly wrapped packages under a tree, we celebrate the gift of God's own son wrapped in swaddling cloths and placed in a feeding trough. And this child, Jesus Christ, truly is the gift that keeps on giving. But his gifts, his greatest gifts, are given in the midst of suffering. See, I don't know if you picked up on it or not, but, but when James says that every good and every perfect gift comes from above, he leaves out a particular descriptor that we all wish was in there. And quite frankly, sometimes we talk as, as if it is in there. The adjective pleasant. Because Jesus shows us that sometimes the best gifts of all 
are the ones we need most and the ones that are received best in the presence of terribly unpleasant circumstances. Steadfast love in the midst of rejection. Gentleness in the midst of violence and hostility. Community and companionship in the midst of loneliness and isolation. Mercy in the midst of a cross. And even life in the midst of death. And this wisdom that James is wanting us to get so that we can understand these things gives us the ability to endure through our suffering because in recognizing our own desperate need for God's great gifts, we begin to appreciate and adore all the more the giver who is our strength and who, as James points out, gives generously to all without reproach, without finding a reason not to give it to us, even though we don't deserve it, without finding a reason to renege on his offer. And not only does this give us the ability to endure through our trials, it helps us actually to view pain itself as a gift. Yes, because it opens us up to receive these good gifts of, of love and mercy and forgiveness, but it also reveals to us something about our Savior, who stepped down out of heaven gladly to be with us, to identify with us where we are, even in our trials and difficulties, and to suffer the worst pain of separation from God on our behalf. See, we have a Savior who offers us the promise now of everlasting life and peace that are ours at no cost to ourselves when he returns. And that's where our strength and that's where our joy are ultimately found. They're not found in the things of this world. They are found in him and him alone. And when I was in college, I learned of... Uh, I learned of a student at my school who was diagnosed with the deadliest form of skin cancer. Starting as a mole on her back, it, it made its way through her lymph nodes into her brain, lungs, and stomach. And shortly before she passed, she, she heard a message on this particular passage, and she wrote in her journal the following. She said, I recently read a quote from Joni Erickson in my Bible study that said, if I could... I would take this wheelchair to heaven with me. Standing next to my Savior, Jesus Christ, I would say, Lord, do you see this wheelchair? Well, before you send it to hell, I want to tell you something about it. You were right when you said that in this world we would have trouble. There's a lot of trouble being a quadriplegic. But you know what? The weaker I was in that thing, the harder I leaned on you. And the harder I leaned on you, the stronger I discovered you to be. Thank you for the bruising blessing it was, this severe mercy. Thank you. She then says, wow, what if we all began to view our suffering, be it physical, emotional, relational, as a bruising blessing, a severe mercy, our scars, wheelchairs, bald heads, all reminding us of God's sovereignty. Yes, when we live our lives in complete submission to our Creator, we can look at each and every scar as a sovereign, sanctifying scar. A scar that because of God's complete sovereignty and His ability and desire to rid us of our sin, helps to lead us into the enjoyment of having a right relationship with God. Therein lies the true blessing of being bruised. Each blessing is found amidst the deep, indescribable relationship that develops between you and God as you trust in him. Lean on him, and he will turn your valley of weeping into a place of springs. In our valleys of weeping, we feel the reality that nothing is over quite like Christmas and then some. But because Jesus Christ himself has turned our valleys into springs, will turn our mourning into joy, we proclaim all the more that there is actually, in fact, nothing quite like Christmas. Because it reminds us that God is with us in our suffering and continues to give us his good and perfect gifts in and out of season. And though our seasons of comfort come and go like the glitz and glamour of Christmas, 
we still celebrate Emmanuel, God with us, even in our suffering. So in our trials, as we proverbially take down the decorations and box up our cheer, may we continue to rejoice and delight in our God who is with us, and day after day showers us with his abundant gifts and brings light into our darkness, turning our sorrow and shame into good and perfect gifts like life and peace. And may we have the wisdom to remain joyful in our tougher times, being sanctified by the scars of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who was given as a gift to us and who himself gives of his life freely as a gift for us. So as we close out 2023 and reign in 2024, I want to do so not by saying nothing's over quite like Christmas anymore, but by shouting from the mountaintops, nothing is quite like Christmas, because the celebration never ends that there is no one quite like Christ. Christ who steps down out of heaven, gives up everything just to be with us. A Christ who suffers with us and ultimately suffered for us. A Christ who picks us up and strengthens us and gives us his good and perfect gifts. So, brothers and sisters, it is my joy to get to say to you today, a week after all the festivities, Merry Christmas. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we... We thank you for seeing us safely into this time and place today, uh, that we might receive your, uh, your gifts and hear your promises, and to be together with one another in community. We thank you also that in your sovereignty, you, you sought fit to send your son to us, uh, into our dark and broken world, so that we may never be alone, not even in our suffering. Lord, we humbly ask that you would, uh, you would send us your spirit to remind us of your truth, to open our eyes to see, uh, to see that you are present with us, to open our hearts to receive the joy that is ours in Christ Jesus, even when we don't feel like rejoicing. God, I pray for all those who are in this room and who are listening in online who might be experiencing the, the tremendous troubles of this world. May we as a community of believers come together to serve and comfort them. And may you send that peace which can only come from you to both comfort and defend them from all that is neither good nor perfect. I also ask that you would uh, you'd be with us all as we usher in the new year. Uh, may you bless all that is uh, new in our lives, all that is new here at Hope especially, be it new people who might who might come through these doors, uh, new leaders who are being formed and raised up, uh, new classes that are being offered. And I humbly ask that, <clears throat> that your hand would be upon us as we, as we seek to serve you, as we seek to love those around us and to be shaped by you. We ask that you would strengthen us by your spirit to, to be enlightened uh, as we read together the New Testament in 2024. Uh, equip us with knowledge and wisdom as we study it, and prepare us against the attacks of the enemy as we seek to live our lives according to it. Lord, in our triumphs, may we never neglect to glorify you. And in our trials, may we ever hold fast to the promises that are ours in your Son, Jesus Christ, and rejoice in a King who came to save us, to be one of us, to suffer for us, and to place upon us a crown of our own, the crown of life that is given freely to us on account of your loving and gracious Son. And it's in his name, the mighty and holy and precious name of Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we continue worshiping? Thank you for the cross.
Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame, in love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the nail-pierced hands. Wash me in your cleansing flow. Now all I know, your forgiveness and embrace. Worthy is the Lamb. See it all.
before we sing this next song, I just kind of want to give you all the reason as to why we chose it. Um, and first and foremost is because there's power in the name of Jesus. Um, there's power to break chains. There's power to heal. Um, there's power to restore and to make new. And as I was studying um, for worship, I got to Acts 3 and 6, and it says, Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. In the preceding scriptures lets us know that the, the man that was lame began to walk. our family and with us going into the new year I just pictured us as a congregation um, as we sing also praying for our family members um, in some of our small groups we used to do this thing where we would just pray for the salvation of our family members and we would just call out their names and so um, when we get to that part I will personally be thinking of my family members that I want to see you know in the church um, to have a relationship with Christ. And there's just power in the name of Jesus. Um, I'll just help us sing this, this new song. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break. Jesus over the darkness in our life. 
life. We trust you, Lord. Move in this place. Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. And Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name of Jesus. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. And Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. Shout Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains. And Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. And Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. Because his name is power. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is love. shadows burn like a fire I know we have some prayer warriors in this room and I know we have people who will share the gospel unrelentlessly declaring uh, victory in the name of Jesus so please just help us sing this part again there's power in the name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Shout, Jesus. Shout, Jesus, from the mountains. And Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name. Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, and Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. Because your name, your name is power. today and let you know that there will be prayer in the front 
or even online, just let them know that you would like some prayer because we would love to continue this prayer for our families in the new year, for boldness, for Jesus to continue to work in our lives and theirs. Go, go in blessings and peace this morning. Thank you.